because it's not about us or humans. It's a matter of not breeding, using, and murdering our fellow animals. It's really pretty simple when you see it from their perspective. Hello and welcome to part two of my response video to Jubilee's Is Eating Animals Wrong? Hunters vs. Vegans. Now if you haven't already seen part one, I encourage you to go back and watch my reaction video so you can see the entire video in the original context. Because there's going to be a lot to go through in this video, so this is going to be an action-packed point-by-point analysis. Also, I just want to say if you're not vegan or an animal advocate, I think you'll still find this conversation useful if you're interested in these issues. Now, if you want to make this a bit more interactive, when the original Jubilee clip is playing, have a think, maybe even pause the video for a moment, and think about what you noticed in the clip. Was there anything you thought was particularly good, or perhaps something that could have been improved upon? Or perhaps any questions you might ask in response to what they said? Then you can listen to my thoughts on the clip and see if we thought of the same things, or maybe you noticed something I didn't mention. Let us know of anything new that you see in the comments, and I'll feature some of these comments in my upcoming videos. Which means it's time for the comments of the week. In my last Jubilee video, Tamcon72 had some excellent observations. They said that, I thought the diction of the questions was not neutral. Notice this right away. I've said elsewhere that the vegans were too concerned about finding common ground with people whose ethics violate ours and too concerned with being considerate towards them, possibly to not make vegans look bad, to address the bullshit framing which could have been done in a way that was respectful to the non-vegan humans. This conversation could have gone in such different, illuminating direction had one of the vegans just been willing to, quote, go there. This has been the comments of the week. Also, if you haven't already, please do hit that subscribe button because it really does help my um, channel to grow and to know that what I'm doing is useful. Also, you may have noticed my name has changed to Jeremy the Ape. Amongst other reasons, I did this to help remind us that humans are in fact hairless apes. We are animals too, and we are not superior to any of our fellow animals. Thank you for all the supportive comments so far, since I've properly come out as an ape. All right, let's get into the breakdown. So you said that you're a mother, and if you think of like Bambi, do you ever consider the small baby animals that you're taking their parents away from them? Okay. So Bambi doesn't exist. <laughs> right. That's a Disney movie. If a mom is there with her yearlings, mm. you would never kill that mom, right? You wait until she kicks them out of the house. And that's part of like ethical hunting. That is like, yeah, no one really, like you wait until the babies are kicked out. So I find the language here fascinating because it's being used as a tool here to distance ourselves from the victims. The whole term yearling, I just find odd. I mean, hunters come up with this whole entire language to distance themselves from the reality that they're murdering unique individuals. And as far as this nonsense about kicking them out of the house, okay, let's put that in a human context. So just because a human child has left the house, now we can murder them? What does that have to do with anything? No human on the face of this planet has a complete understanding of the relationship between a parent and a child in another species especially considering all those relationships are going to be unique. Just because you don't happen to see them around doesn't mean you should shoot the parents. Just because you think they've kicked them out of the house. Let's go home before I get too fired up. If you have a choice of where you get to get your food and where it comes from and even knowing about it is a privilege. So this is another question prompt that I honestly think while it's a common misconception that maybe needs to be explored, I honestly think this completely misses the point. Because as Brittany rightly says, being able to choose your food is a privilege I guess in a sense, especially compared to um, some individuals in the world. However, what's important is, do you have that ability? And everyone on this video seems to have that ability. So to me, it's a bit of a moot point. I think that choice is a privilege and veganism is a choice. Okay, so this is another big topic for me, um, especially when it comes to language, because I used to use the language, you know, choose vegan over, you know, um, go vegan and other alternatives for a while to emphasize that it is a choice. However, I'm not so sure that's the case anymore. Is not murdering someone really a choice, or is it more of a moral obligation? I think overemphasizing veganism as a choice could reinforce the objection that it's a personal choice not to be vegan, 
as well as implying that it's choice of buying white pants or black pants. It's just a choice. When it's really not, it's a moral obligation to do what's right and respect for others, regardless of their species. Veganism, especially in the States and especially in like the global West, has been totally co-opted by like, I'm just gonna say it, by whiteness. Veganism shouldn't be a privilege in my opinion, but it is, like the world that we live in now, it is. Okay, I'm actually quite disappointed that Danny took the conversation here because the focus of this dialogue is eating animals wrong, which I think we should unpack that language real quick too because to me that is a vegetarian message, not a vegan one. However, the focus of this discussion should be on our fellow animals. I discussed this recently on a live stream with Roger Yates and whether or not our movement is overly human-centric. And I think there's a lot of indications that it is. Now what the cause for this, I think is a whole nother discussion, but I think we first need to acknowledge it so that we can start to address it. Now I have no doubt that the perceptions around veganism need to shift. And a lot of non-vegans probably do associate veganism with so-called whiteness. However, rather than taking the time to complain about it, why not lift up animal advocates who aren't white? There's plenty of them out there. Instead, we just seem to like to highlight this drama rather than try to resolve it. Maybe I'll leave the rest of my thoughts for that for a future video. I don't know enough about being a vegan. I think of it as like something that rich white people do, but I don't know. Mm. I, don't, I don't know any vegans. I don't know how much money it costs. Well, I don't agree with a lot of what Carly says. I do really value the transparency in saying that I just really don't know. I also think it's interesting that Carly doesn't know any vegans in their life. I think this says a lot that she hasn't really been exposed to the topic that much. And as far as affordability, I think we all know the common line, you know, when we focus on whole foods, rice, beans, potatoes, and so on, it doesn't have to be more expensive. It can actually save you a lot of money. That's been my experience, especially when we don't focus on processed prepackaged meals, which doesn't necessarily require cooking. I'm quite happy to eat tins straight out of the bean. It makes a great meal and there's no cleanup. I'm being serious here though. Feel free to ask me for my recipe in the comments. You want the easiest meals. You want the highest calorie meals because you're working and you're burning so many calories. So when you're saying, why don't you eat more plant-based? You're asking them to change their shopping habits. You're asking them to spend more time. You're asking them to educate themselves. And when you are working that hard, you, you have to numb yourself. You are eating to survive. That is different than choosing what you're eating. So I think this is actually a really interesting thing to ponder because while I absolutely do not think this should be an excuse or a pass to support animal use, I do think it's important for animal advocates to acknowledge some of the challenges we're up against. Because to contemplate moral questions and especially deep ones that we've been supporting the other side of for our entire lives, it does take some time and energy to possibly research that topic. And the first shop may take a little bit longer. Now I think for most of us who have done this, we acknowledge that it's well worth it and it's really not that much more difficult for most people. However, I think by understanding this situation, we can better respond to it. Because I think in a sense, Brittany's right. If people are so busy with their own lives, they don't really have the energy or the space to contemplate some of these big moral questions, let alone respond and address them in their own lives. So I think we should keep exploring new ways to respond to this claim and finding ways that we can perhaps make the idea of living vegan easier. If we were all born like three centuries from now, the world has been globalized and like agriculture can reach every corner of the globe. How would that affect, if at all, your views or your choices? Am I gonna be judged if I say not at all? <laughs> I'm genuinely curious. Yeah, I don't, I mean, like I'm gonna eat meat. I don't wanna say there's no reason to not eat meat, but there's maybe no reason for me not to eat meat. I get, I get it. I get I'm it. feeling judged. <laughs> okay, so I think it's interesting how um, Danny's going to these hypotheticals. I personally don't enjoy hypotheticals a lot myself because I think the real world has enough examples of moral atrocities that we don't need to go to the hypothetical to ponder these, although I can see why they're doing it. I think it's first interesting that Carly responds with this whole um, fear of judgment, which brings us to the whole discussion of shame versus guilt and guilt feeling bad about the behavior and shame um, feeling bad as a person. Now I think where possible we should try to avoid this shame response, which in fairness I think might have been overly done by the vegans in this video. 
However, I think we can navigate this risk of judgment while still delivering a clear abolitionist message. I also really think it's interesting here because it's quite clear that Carly doesn't actually understand veganism. Because it's not about us or humans, it's about our fellow animals. So it's not about a matter of what humans can get from it. It's a matter of not breeding, using, and murdering our fellow animals. It's really pretty simple when you see it from their perspective. Also a more subtle point, I think when Don Marvin just kind of says, I get it, I think I would have much rather hear someone on the vegan side of things point out that it's not about humans. This is where that shift on the human-centric really got nailed in, as Guywin rightly pointed out in the comments of my last video. All right, well with that, I tried to hit all the main points. Please let me know in the comments anything I've missed. So do make sure to subscribe, that little orange button somewhere down there at the bottom. Um, make sure to click that so you can be notified when the other parts are released. Also, thanks a lot for all the comments you leave, the likes, the shares, they all really mean a lot to me. Because I think there's a lot of these concepts that we can use to strengthen our animal advocacy, especially when it comes to language. And we're going to be able to better do that if we do it together. Thank you for all you do for our fellow animals, and I'll see you in the next video. For free resources, such as a discussion guide and language document, check out veganinteractions.com. Thanks for watching.